Hello and welcome to the DSP Leaders Summit on 5G Evolution. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content at Telecom TV, and coming up now is our Challenges and Opportunities Roundtable, where we'll be discussing the cloud-native approach to 5G. 5G is accelerating the move towards wider cloud-native adoption in telcos, along with advances in automation, AI and orchestration. But is the future evolution of 5G wholly dependent upon a shift to cloud-native practices? Well, let's find out what our guests think, and I'm delighted to introduce Ling Li Deng, Technical Manager, Senior Researcher, Artificial Intelligence and Intelligent Operations Center with China Mobile Research Institute. Paul Miller, Chief Technology Officer for Wind River. And Richard Band, Head of Mobile Core and 5G Communication Technology Group at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Hello everyone, very good to see you all. Thank you for taking part in the round table. Now, we asked our viewers what they regarded as the main issues around cloud native for 5G. And from that feedback, we've created five key questions. So here's the first one. Is a cloud native approach to 5G the best solution for a telco? And if so, why? Ling Li, perhaps I could start the conversation with you. We are still in the early phase of rolling out our national wide 5G service and because we want to first of all to accelerate the network construction and deliver as as, as, as soon as possible to our subscribers so we are not dictating our solution providers to start with a cloud native um you know path for the 5G uh, network construction at least at the early phase but we see the potential of you know um leveraging further um, the capabilities of uh, cloud native approach. And we are also pulling our resources with our partners to further develop a standardization and you know, specifications to allow us to leverage multi band solution to provide that um, into production. So um, I think um, cloud native approach has a great potential for our further 5G evolution but it is too early for us to tell whether or not it is the best solution. Thanks, Ling Lee. Well, Paul, let me ask the same question to you. you know, is it too early to tell yet, or, or do you have a clear answer? And do you think a cloud native approach to 5G is now the best solution for a telco? I do, and I think it's, uh, I think it's very clear now. Uh, we've seen a lot of reasons behind why this change is happening. Uh, we found, for example, that um, you can actually deploy 5G VRAN infrastructure at lower cost and higher performance using a general purpose uh, compute approach using virtualization and, and cloud native technologies than using the bespoke appliance uh, approach that we used to use in the industry. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting is think about the business from the service provider's perspective. Uh, previously with 2G, 3G and 4G, you had a lot of competition as the initial network was one. But once the network is won, the service provider has very little commercial leverage over the, the incumbent vendors that are then deployed in their networks for often well over 10 years. With a cloud native approach, you have disaggregation. You have the separation of the hardware, the infrastructure, and the application layers. And what that means is that with commoditized hardware, it tends to keep the, uh, the hardware vendors pleasing the service pro provider throughout the life of the deployment. With the infrastructure layer, there's competition there that continues throughout the life of the deployment. And of course, at the application layer as well, uh, especially with things like orchestration, enabling the service provider to swap out a uh, application com component at a, at a mere whim, right? The, the time to deployment is seconds now instead of months and years. So when you combine these things with a couple of other attributes, one being the operational simplicity of this, you've got a fully virtualized network from the core to the edge now in a service provider where you can manage and deploy applications from a centralized pane of glass without rolling trucks anymore. It's the modernization of the service provider network to, to be more like you know, Google, and, Google and others that run their networks fully virtualized. Um, and so I think we see a massive transformation happening here and, and kind of the, 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 the nail in the lid that, that uh, makes this emphatically uh, true is that if you think about 5G from a business perspective, from a service provider, they're really trying to uh, not just transform and invest in their network to have the same thing they had with 4G, just at higher expense. 
they're looking to do this to create new revenue streams. And things like uh, telemedicine and Industry 4 Auto, the, the massive explosion in device count with uh, industrial IoT and IoT in general, um, autonomous vehicles, et cetera. These contemporary consumer expectations for these services are driving new applications that need to be deployed to the edge of the network. And if you don't have a cloud native infrastructure all the way up to the edge of the network, these low latency applications can't be deployed. And so it's becoming a, a foundational capability to have a cloud native network out to the edge in order to support these new revenue generating applications being co-located with the VRAN infrastructure. Thanks, Paul. Um Richard, you know, we've been approaching how we create cellular networks the same for, for, for a lot of years now. So with, with 5G and, and cloud native, you know, kind of kind of happening at, at the same time, we, we've got an opportunity to, to change how we, we approach how we create and construct and architect these networks. So what's your opinion? Is a cloud native approach to 5G now the best solution for a telco? Yeah, I, I certainly believe so. I mean, what Ling Lee said, I, I can understand that for the initial deployments, the focus is on getting the solution out. And, and certainly the initial use cases that are around EMBB, probably you can do without cloud native. But as, as Paul was pointing out, the next stage of this is going to be about deploying you know, very new innovative solutions, uh, probably differentiated depending on the industry. And so the way that we look at it at the Hewlett Packard Enterprises, 5G is a little bit different than previous generations of networks in the sense that the, the network itself is just a, an initial piece of the end-to-end -end solution. And so in order to fully realize the potential of 5G and the ability to transform different industries, we actually need a network that allows for much faster innovation because those telemedicine applications are not defined by a free GPP panel and then build out over 10 years. They will be coming up as we work with different industry partners. So we need a more open, open ecosystem. We need an ability to work with those partners in a very iterative way and test out things. And then if they work, we need to be able to roll them out very quickly. So the speed of innovation is critical. And at the same time, we're talking about a network that is going to be highly dynamic, a network where we expect to have uh, network slicing where we expect to be able to move workloads around as demand materializes and moves from one generation to another, from one industry sector to another. And so such a highly dynamic network is requiring a high degree of automation. What we've seen is that, you know, cloud native technologies have proven to be very good at bringing very quickly change into any environment, including the networks. They are able to bring that at a very granular level, avoiding the big forklift changes that we were used to in telecom. And typically the way they do it, the way they're being done is fully automated and automated baked in from the, from the get go. And I think that's a, a, an approach that we need to embrace in, in telecoms. We have thought about innovation in, in two long cycles, and we have tended to look at automation as something that is built on top after the fact rather than from the from the original design of the solution. So in my mind, cloud native is definitely uh, the right way to go mid to long term. Again, I agree with Ling Lee. On the short term, you may get by with something that is not cloud native. But I think the moment you start to really try to monetize and go into the industry verticals, it is absolutely critical to have cloud native technology underpinning your network. OK, thank you, Richard. And thank you, everyone, for that uh, answers for that first question. Um, Paul, I'm going to come to you for our second question uh, because you spoke about how this new generation of especially vertical oriented services are dependent upon cloud native. Um, the question is, how much of 5G today is already cloud native dependent or at least f favors cloud native? I would say that the launch of 5G infrastructure on a cloud native in, you know, environment is very new, right? With the early deployments were done with uh, the legacy approach with um, you know, carrier grade physical hardware out at the edge. Um, our company was uh, at Wind River. We were fortunate enough to be part of the, the very first fully virtualized 5G data session that was conducted in the world using cloud native infrastructure. And since then I've been working um, with one of our customers, Verizon, on deployment of the uh, a cloud native approach for 5G VRAN in the network, uh, as you've seen in several press releases. And that is really the tip of the spear, right? I think that we're seeing 
now um, mass adoption of these principles uh, throughout the globe. We're seeing a lot of uptake in Japan and in uh, Europe. And um, um, so we think the, the wave has started and it's really driven by what we were just talking about it. The, the non-sustainability of using the legacy approach is now pretty apparent. And the, the ease of operation, the lower cost of deployment, the higher performance, the ability to support multiple applications in the infrastructure, and really the full virtualization of the, of the service provider network is now a foundational assumption for uh, service providers building out their networks. And we therefore see that, you know, although we're at an early stage today, it'll be shifting towards mass adoption over the next couple of years. Thanks, Paul. And Richard, you know, when we talk about 5G, it does encompass a lot of different technologies. It encompasses a, a lot of areas of, of the network for an operator. So how, how much of what we call 5G today is, is already cloud native, would you say? Well, it's difficult to say because um, I think there's um, you know, quite obviously there, there is some, um, some cloud washing that's happening in the industry. So, you know, Paul was talking about the initial deployments being done on legacy technologies. You know, we've clearly seen that uh, people have taken virtualized technologies, VM-based installations, and then simply you know, shoved these big VMs into uh, into a container and said, hey, we're done, we're, we're cloud native. And obviously cloud native entails a lot more. It, it entails a separation of the data and the application processing. It entails you know, breaking up your, your software into much smaller microservices that have independent life cycles, et cetera, et cetera. So as a general, you know, a general statement on the industry for me is difficult to make. For sure, um, on our side, we have clearly made a decision very early on when we looked at 5G. We said, yeah, we could implement you know, service-based interface, HTTP2, et cetera, et cetera. We could do that using our same software architectures before. But if you want to really achieve the dynamicity, the innovation we talked about before, you need to go cloud native. So we've done exactly that. We started from scratch. What we are hearing from our customers is that at this point, that is certainly still a differentiating uh, approach. So my take on it is that it means others may, may have decided to go more of an evolutionary approach and uh, retain more of the existing software assets to have a, a smaller, uh, smaller change in, uh, in a, maybe a more limited investment to make the 5G a reality. Great. Thanks very much, everyone. Let's move on to our, our next viewer question, and that's really about the development and standardization of 5G. We know that global cellular networks are so dependent on adherence to, to global standards, and it's a massive amount of, of work. But is the development of 5G going forward and its standardization, is it going to rely more on cloud native? In other words, is cloud native going to be effectively baked in to 5G as we move ahead. Richard, do you have any views on, on this? Yeah, certainly within the standards, we see even in the, the documents that have been circulating within free GPP, we see the notion, the mention, explicit mention of clouds more and more. Um, having said that, we have to recognize that telecom is a special world. And while we try to adopt as much as possible standard IT tools and technologies, there will always be a telecom specific element to it. So on the one hand, we, do, we see you know, concepts being transposed. So for instance, the separation of application data and call processing is in my mind, exactly what has been leading to the introduction of the UDSF uh, concept in the, in the 5G core, which allows to store the, the application data, unstructured application data separate from the individual network function. So, taking that same concept, but applying it into telecom and defining a standard interface to access that data, to allow interoperability between multiple network functions and a standardized UDSF. So I think this is one example of where the, the concept is certainly being used, but then being adapted to, um, to telecoms. Um, another area that we've seen is you know, the, the NRF function, which is the, the network registration. So to identify where network functions are sitting. And obviously there, there are capabilities in say Kubernetes that allow to do something similar in an IT world. However, the mobility aspect, the, the need to be aware about uh, the network slice model and things like that mean that you cannot simply take the existing capabilities and we still have a need to build something on top that is more telecom specific. So in the end, what I think we'll see is a blend of concepts, but slightly adapted into, into the telecom world. 
which would then be making it very easy for us in the implementation phase to say, okay, you know what? If you're moving in this direction anyway, then we can implement using cloud native technologies, but they're not mandated per se, and the cloud native by itself will not be sufficient to cover all aspects. Thanks, Richard. And Ling Li, I think you, you were nodding there towards the end of Richard's answer. What, what's, what's your view? Do you, do you think that we'll see cloud native uh, being um, more influential in the 5G standards process, which, which in itself would lead to some uh, interesting scenarios moving ahead? Exactly, because, you know, my staff has been studying and analyzing, um, you know, uh, the service-based architecture of 5G. And we also pay special attention to uh, the network function and specify there, especially, um, um, you know, UDSF, as, as just mentioned by Richard. And um, also there are other network functions as defined and to show the notion um, to separate, um, you know, the status and um, keeping the network functions as a stateless um, and um, towards the notion of cloud native application. But what we see lacking in standardization is that um, there's still ambiguity in the REST API definitions among those network functions, which, which makes the, um, the service based architecture, um, especially in deployment and as a statement in the paper, rather than, you know, um, the fact that we, we can um, already leverage at least from our service providers or our vendors. So our vendors are still deploying in silos and all the um, 5G core networks, as well as the service bus, microservice bus are tightly coupled. So what we would like to see in the real cloud native deployment is that we could separate as it is specified um, the cloud native infrastructure from the application vendors. And to do that, we still need further uh, standards um, specifications among those different network functions and also between network functions and the cloud native infrastructure. And um, especially on um, the UDSF functions uh, or its interactions with other network functions are actually not specified in GPP specifications. And those we would like to see, um, you know, to getting uh, more uh, efforts from other um, our industry partners so that we can quickly accelerate those related standards um, process. And Paul, do you see more incursion of, of cloud native practices and methodologies into the more traditional cellular 5G standards and development process? I think we do a little bit. You know, obviously, the 3GPP and ITF are focused on a, a functional block um, architecture, right, where each of the components within 5G core and radio edge are defined with their interfaces and functional behaviors. <clears throat> and it's left as an exercise to the implementer as to how they they create those. So it's not currently mandated. Uh, however, obviously, as we've been talking about, there's a significant shift in the industry. NFV as an Etsy standard is called out um, quite clearly throughout 3GPP documentation. And, and obviously with the NFV release four that came out in 2020 with Etsy, uh, there were significant enhancements added specifically so, to support 5G. So I think you're, you're seeing the, the various standards organizations moving forward with uh, certainly welcoming the the promise of what cloud native and cloud technology can provide to a 5G and mobile architecture. Um, so I think we'll see that continue to change as we go uh, through the next uh, several years. Uh, and inevitably, if the, the market shifts to use this as the predominant infrastructure approach, it will become formally part of uh, 3GPP standards, uh, perhaps in partnership continuing with IETF and Etsy. Well, our next uh, question from our audience, is, it's, it's related to the one we've, we've just been discussing here. So Ling Li, I'm going to come to you first with this one, because I know you've, you've touched on this in your answer already, I think. But we are told that telecoms needs to adopt a software and cloud first approach. Now, this could remove this decade long standards process that bridges the R&D, the development process with actual network deployment. And traditionally over the past few decades, it's been like a 10 year window 
for each significant generational jump of cellular. But, you know, is the industry prepared to make this change? Are we ready to, to embrace this and actually make this change? Well, um, I should say that we started explorations like uh, seven or eight years ago internally um, from China Mobile, uh, especially from the research part. But uh, we have uh, innovative ideas. We have uh, done a lot of pilots with, um, you know, our partners. But when we are moving towards production, we're really facing the challenge of changing the um, operation culture um, of the company. So when we're doing, you know, um, doing a soft software or anti transition, this is not only a technical transition, it actually requires the operational transition. So when you're operating a hardware network or real um, operating a software network, it's totally different. So it requires fundamental uh, change, um, the culture change, the scale change from the operation stuff. And if you are not ready in that transition, uh, the technical won't help you um, as much as you would expect, but will drain you into a lot of more trouble. Uh, as we found out after the scale deployment of our NFB network for 4G um, expansion uh, plan, um, we see that the operation cost um, as much as doubled, uh, while the, the rest of the operation staff remains uh, largely unchanged for the last three years. And the main change of that increased operation cost is because that we um, adopted a disaggregated uh, manner and in introducing virtualization technology, but the operation stuff and operational manner of processes are remains uh, as much as what we did for the traditional network. So with 5G, we are um, continuously uh, building the culture uh, and changing in the operational workflow and building the capabilities and trying to make the DevOps not only as a technical tool, but also a um, practice, a practical norm for us to do that. And I think um, that would be the the biggest challenge for us to adopt and further leverage on um, cloud native like technologies when we're moving further towards the software um, you know, transition. But we'll certainly get there as as a, you know, as we see for the potential of 5G, we do really need to change that as we are to achieve service agility as well as reducing the cost for more customers, especially for verticals. So um, that is the future and that is the challenge we we're facing and we need to overcome it. Yeah, it's very interesting, Lily. Thank you, Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Paul, we'd all like to go faster. We'd all like to accelerate the time from from uh, you know, development into, into deployment and it's cloud, adopt a cloud-first uh, approach. But it does come with, um, with pitfalls if, if we're not uh, prepared for it. Do, do, do you think the industry as a whole is ready and willing to, to make this change collectively? I think that they're in various stages. You know, when we talk to different service providers globally, we find some that are very much proponents and well down the road of adopting this. There are others that you know, have valid questions about how we are, how am I going to support this, right? And, you know, I used to go to one company to support my um, RAN network, and now it's disaggregated. Now, the disaggregation has the benefits that we talked about previously, but uh, the service provider is concerned that they can, um, you know, be able to go to each of the vendors there and have them work together in their network, as you have now have a, a hardware vendor, an infrastructure layer vendor, at multiple application vendors that are coming together to provide the complete uh, network solution. Uh, so depending on where you are in that evolution, there's various levels of adoption, right? As you go across the globe. I think the other thing that um, we don't see the, the market yet ready for is obviously the cloud native approaches, Kubernetes as a technology and microservices applications tend to bring in new capabilities for things like CI, CD and DevSecOps, new modern tool sets for building and deploying the applications and being able to deploy and upgrade the services. And that requires a shift in the application vendors uh, adopting that. Like, you know, as it was spoken about earlier, you can't just take a virtual machine and stick it in a container and say you're cloud native. 
you really uh, often re-architect or, or build the first time for a new application like 5G in a microservices model that supports continuous integration and continuous delivery in a cloud native framework. And this is really what the service providers need because it enables them to perform live software patching and live update directly into the field in a cloud native environment, but it requires the applications to be built properly to do that. Um, and not only the application layer, but the infrastructure itself needs to be uh, CI CD enabled in order to deliver continuous improvements to the field. Uh, this kind of modern way of doing software development and deployment and operations uh, is a bit new for the service provider industry. They're used to touching their deployment once a year with a major software upgrade, for example. Uh, but this is part and parcel of what makes an agile cloud native environment a fully virtualized service provider infrastructure. And we think this will get adopted over time as well as the service providers begin to understand more and more what cloud native really means. Thanks, Paul. Well, let's move on to our final question um, that we received from polling our viewers. And, you know, over the years, it's been apparent that there's been increasing interest in, in various cloud native approaches, such as, as containers and Kubernetes, etc. But now we're starting to hear about service mesh. So this, this final question from our audience asks a very direct question. Uh, Richard, I'm going to come to you first on this one. Will we see 5G adopt a service service mesh, excuse me, architecture to facilitate scalability challenges? Um, well, service mesh certainly has a a place in uh, in this in this world. Um, it's not the magic wand that solves all problems, and it does come with a a price to pay in terms of. Um, in terms of performance. So what we are seeing is that service mesh is the right tool to use in certain circumstances. It gives us you know, some built-in resiliency capabilities. Um, it gives us a telemetry that otherwise we would not have readily available. So there, there are a certain number of benefits from, uh, from the service mesh. But you know, for some use cases, that really is not so so relevant. For instance, when we look at uh, smaller scale deployments like private networking, you may challenge whether the service mesh is really adding the value, especially in an environment where you're very much resource constrained, the, the trade-off may be different. So again, I see a lot of value. We are definitely adopting service mesh in our solutions today. We've, we've actually been using it since we, we started down the, the path on, uh, on cloud native, but we're also realizing that there are circumstances where it may be better to disable and to go with a direct connectivity approach. Thanks, Richard. And Ling Li, is Service Mesh um, a applicable technology for telecoms operators, you know, especially when they look towards scalability with, say, signaling traffic? Um, I think this question is a little bit, you know, outreaching for me. And from my understanding, Service Mesh is an option and actually um, providing common. Um, and it's like, um, communication or uh, providing some of the common services to application developers. And for us, we see that the um, you know, network function as a cloud native or not as a black box and, and for now. And so we are not that much um, you know, into the cloud native infrastructure. But uh, if we could, I see that service mesh has the potential of, you know, using the application and development, and perhaps it would be really helpful for us to um, extending or our um, application ecosystem. But for core network function, and especially as the signaling um, handling part of the control plan, I think um, at least for the time being, we will be still relying on our major vendor partners. And um, we would very much likely to also rely on them to, um, to make the decision whether or not they would leverage service mesh or not. Thank you. And Paul, um, finally to you for, for this round table, what's your opinion on service mesh? Is it applicable to, to 5G? Can it be adopted in, in 5G networks? I think it's applicable. It depends where you are in the network, whether it makes sense or not. So if you look at the, the far edge of the network where applications like the 5G VRAN uh, VDU function is running, 
That is such a high performance real time application that is on a small footprint compute platform, perhaps running a uh, you know, version of Kubernetes with a cloud native runtime that because that application is designed to be extremely high performance and it's not coexisting with a lot of other vendors applications, the service mesh doesn't really have a place. At the same time in the core of the network, if you think about the, the CAS and PaaS layers, service meshes like Istio are a critical part of that PaaS component that enables application development and interaction. So, uh, you know, as you move from the core to the edge, I see it's declining in value. That may change over time as multiple applications get mixed at the edge. But right now, absolutely, uh, you know, Istio type service meshes and other variants of them are, are prevalent in the, in the network. And one of the interesting reasons we see for that is not just for managing all the, the API and, and communications interactions between the services, but a security perspective, right? This provides a, a clean demarcation point between the various vendors' uh, interactions and enables you to have a more secure application environment. And that seems to be of interest to the service providers as well. Ling Lei, did you want to, uh, to comment on, on that? Uh, yes, uh, I think the, the last point, um, you know, brought up by Paul, I, I, I would like to echo that because service mesh actually provides a uniform communication channel um, to different applications. So it might be a good option for us to do another version of DPI, <laughs> things like that. So we can add security scanning and, and do the full monitoring of what is going on and, you know, between network functions. So that would be providing a convenient point for the security and, you know, and inspection and those kind of like things. But it also adds the performance bottlenecks because what we're doing and the current way of doing this is uh, we add another traffic mirroring device that won't be in the critical parts of doing communication between network functions. So those would be the extra communication overhead that would add to the performance uh, drain and um, you know potential. So um, it might be a trade-off, and uh, I very much agree with you that it's dependent on the scenario. Um, so if the performance is not the issue, and this would be convenient for ad security. Well, it's, it's going to be interesting to see which cloud native tools and methodologies do get ad adapted and used within 5G as 5G develops. With that, we've got to draw our discussion to a close. But thank you all very much for participating and sharing your views and opinions. Now, if you're watching this on day one of our DSP Leaders Summit on 5G Evolution, then don't forget to send us any questions you have on the subject and we'll try and answer them in our live after show program. And that's later today. And do take part in our online poll. You can find it below this video player window next to the Q&A app. All of today's programs are available to view online here at Telecom TV and we'll have more roundtable discussions for you tomorrow. Until then, don't forget to tune in for the after show. But for now, thanks for watching and goodbye.